your Bibles, turn over to Matthew chapter 13, verse 44. Matthew 13, 44, and Jordan, you can turn me down just a hair. Can you hear? Um, okay, then maybe don't turn me down. I thought I was hearing me. Matthew 13, 44. Jesus speaking here. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like treasure hidden in a field, which a man found and hid. And for the joy over it, he goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. Again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who then, when he had found one, a pearl of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Father, we come before you in the name of Jesus. Lord, we thank you uh, for the the power of your word, Lord God. We thank you uh, for your forgiveness, your love, your mercy, Lord God, uh, your grace that's upon our lives. Lord, uh, we uh, uh, yield this service to you, and we say, have your way. Have your way here. Have your way in our lives. Uh, Lord, it's our desire to receive from you. Uh, we love you. We honor you. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. The kingdom of heaven, Jesus is speaking in parables to his uh disciples and his followers all throughout the gospels and uh, one of the central themes of jesus's parables was about the kingdom the kingdom the kingdom we got to be about the kingdom in this day and this hour can you say amen i mean that's the that's got to be a priority in our life and and sometimes we get skewed off and we start working on our own kingdom or building uh building what we want to put our hands to but my heart's desire and i know for everyone here as well we want to be kingdom minded because we're kingdom agents we want to make a difference. I don't want to live my uh, number of years on this on this planet and not make a difference or my, not make a dent in what God's called me to do. And uh, Jesus is reminding us here that the kingdom of heaven is like a treasure that's hidden in a field. Um, it's something precious, something to uh, to grab a hold of, something to make a sacrifice for. And he goes on to explain it's like a treasure in a field which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it goes and sells all that he has it's it's sometimes there's a, a misnomer of, of being a sellout and i'll gladly wear that label of being a sellout because i've sold out to jesus he has it all everything that i have everything that i am uh, my life is so uh, uh, our lives are so wrapped up into following jesus i i tell i when I'm chatting with Pastor Jim or chatting with my wife, sometimes I sit here and think of like, how does somebody make it in this life without Jesus? I mean, it's like, it, it boggles my mind. And I know that there's some people that they find joy, they find, you know, they find what level of joy they can have here, what level of peace that they can operate in. But I cannot um, wrap my head around how somebody makes it without having the Prince of Peace in their life. I can't make it, uh, I, can't, I can't fathom not having God's forgiveness and his mercy that's new every morning of, of it's like walking with Jesus just becomes so integrated into what we do. It's a part of the way we talk. Can you say amen? It's the way we live our lives. It's the way we conduct business. It's the way we interact with, with each other. It's the way we build relationship. It's the way we have fellowship. We're kingdom-minded uh, when we have church together. And when we're doing things under the kingdom and for the kingdom, things start to work on our behalf. Can you say amen? It doesn't mean that we're not going to experience persecution. It doesn't mean we're not going to have obstacles or mountains or challenges uh, because those who desire to live godly are going to suffer persecution. And persecution is ramping up in our day and our hour. Can you say amen? And there's a t it, it, it ticked me off so much when I saw over the last few years where uh, they were jailing pastors for gathering people uh, to have a service in the United States where we have the freedom of worship. Can you say amen? That's protected by our government or supposed to be protected by our constitution. And, and, and that just becomes a test or a tipping point for what those that are of the Antichrist system wants to do. Uh, the enemy still wants to shut up Christians. He still wants to get people compromised. He still wants to get us out of rhythm. And if he can't do it to you, he's going to do it to someone close to you. Can you say amen? And that sometimes for me is not always, is, isn't always the, the, the direct assault on me, but it's the challenges with children, the challenges with other family members, the challenges of the things that are happening in our country. And 
in spite of all those things, I have to go back, renew my mind, get back to being kingdom focused to know that you and I, we are like those who found the treasure in the field. And when I found Jesus, I didn't know exactly what I'd found. Like I, well, I knew enough, I knew enough when I gave my heart to the Lord that I was a sinner, that I needed to be saved, and that I needed to live for him. That's about as much as I, that's about as much as I knew at that time, but that was enough to get me in and then grow and grow and grow. Um, we we found a treasure, something to, something to hold on to, something to grab, uh, something to uh, value in our life. Our, our walk with the Lord, need, we need to treat it with esteem and with value. Can you say amen? Not just something as, as common parlance. And I, I, get, I get that Jesus is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. But even as Jesus is a friend, he's also master. He's savior. He's deliverer. He's redeemer. He's healer. He's king of kings. He's prince of peace. He's the alpha, the omega, the beginning and the end. He's the first and the last. He's, he changes not. He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. And on top of all those things, he wants to have a relationship with you and I. The creator of the universe, fellowship with us, wanting fellowship with you and I, opening up avenues through prayer and supplication and intercession so that we can make our, bring up our petitions and we know that our prayers rise up uh, to God as, as a sweet-smelling aroma, as an incense, as a memorial before God. And in this thing, we, we have to value, and I, I fear sometimes in our present day and our hour is some Christians have treated their relationship with the Lord so commonly that they no longer treat it as value as something to, to hang on to, to endure with. Can you say amen? It's something that we have to renew. It's something I know for me. It's something I have to work with on a daily basis. I cannot go into neutral. I can't go into cruise control. I can't, I mean, there's going to be, there's going to be seasons. There's going to be waves of refreshing. There's going to be times where there's going to be, you know, intense passion. There's other times where it's going to be sweet rest. But, but in that whole thing, it's never going on cruise control, on cruise control uh, because following Jesus is uphill all day long. The kingdom of heaven is like a, a, a treasure that's hidden in the field, which a man found and hid, and for the joy over it, he sells all that he has and buys that field. The only way I know how to make it uh, living for the Lord in our day and our hour is to completely sell out, to give up everything. Um, uh, Philippians chapter 2, the apostle Paul reminds us that Jesus made himself of no reputation. And we live in a generation where reputations are are valued and sometimes reputations are assaulted. Uh, but whose reputation was more assaulted than Jesus's reputation? I mean, Jesus, perfect, sinless. We, I say this often. He lived the life that I should have lived, died the death that I deserved to die, was betrayed by one of his closest friends, was brought before two different kangaroo courts and found guilty in their eyes, yet he was without sin. He violated nothing. He came to fulfill the law and the prophets. He was full of grace and truth. He called the sinner to repentance. He called the religious to repentance so they would no longer be whitewashed tomb, but they would start to walk with the Lord that they... That that they professed to follow, yet in spite of all that, he was tried as an innocent man, found guilty in the eye of man, died a vicarious death, a gruesome death upon a cross, was buried in a borrowed tomb, and was raised on the third day for our justification. And the same power that raised Christ from the dead also makes alive or quickens our mortal bodies. <clears throat> Verse 45, again, the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant seeking beautiful pearls, who when he had found one of great price, went and sold all that he had and bought it. Uh, this we know about treasure. Treasure is valuable. It, it costs something. Uh, number two, we know that treasure is uncommon. It, treasure isn't everywhere all the time. Number three, we know this, that when you find a treasure, you want to hang on to it. Don't let it go. You protect it. You keep it safe. It's, uh, the worth of a treasure is determined by the individual. Now, now, I know for me, like, there are certain things that I find super valuable that other people would not find valuable at all. I have, a, I have like, like, two of the things I still have from my dad. I have a, 
I have an old, old extension cord that's probably like 25 years old, and it still works. And actually, I just used it this last week. Monday, Tuesday, I used it. And I have this really old air hose that I've drug around on hundreds of hundreds of roofs over these last 20 years. And to anybody else, if I threw, if I threw a, a tag on it in a garage sale, I'd probably have somebody come at the end of the garage sale and say, I'll give you, I'll give you a dollar for both of them. Right. And they'd probably feel like they're overpaying. Right. <laughs> but to me, uh, because of what it represents, it becomes a treasure, it becomes something valuable, it becomes something to take care of. Now, it, now, when I'm no longer here, if I, if I don't go the way of the rapture and it's passed down to my kids, they may not think it's very valuable, but to me it is. To me, it's a treasure that I want to hold on to, and it hangs upon my garage walls uh, d day in and day out. So we protect it, we keep it safe, that the worth is determined by the individual. No, on top of all that, a treasure is, is something that somebody's willing to sacrifice for to pay a price to get. Um, we, we treasure our hearts. Can you say amen? Uh, if somebody's not willing to make a sacrifice for your heart, then, then what does that say about them? Or on the other side is, is what does it say about a person who gives of their heart without somebody else making a sacrifice? For treasure, we have to be willing to make a sacrifice. And, and throughout the treasure, there's always the reminder of the sacrifice. Uh, at least, there's at least three ways to view this parable. Number one, the treasure is Jesus. We found him when we weren't even looking for him. And he was calling to us. Uh, I, I'm always reminded, uh, I love Pastor Al's testimony. Pastor Al, when you first a attended a service at Victorious Life Church, were you looking for Jesus? You, you were showing up uh, because your wife was dragging you and you just wanted to be the nice young husband that w got along and made her happy for that day. But then, through the preaching of the word, through the conviction of the Holy Spirit, uh, through inspired prophetic teaching, um, radically saved. Radically saved. <laughs> I mean, the, uh, someone who'd grown up far from God, radically saved because because they found the treasure and the treasure found them. And we, we can all have those various testimonies in our lives of those treasures that we found. I found God when I really wasn't looking for him, but at the time when I was a young teenager, when I needed him the most. And it doesn't matter when, when we find it, it's that we found it and, and what great uh, honor it is to know the Lord from a very, very early age, like some of these young men and Sammy sitting back there. Who all they've known is living for Jesus. All they've seen is people, I mean, they've seen other things, but, but it's, they grew up here. And then I think of like my own, my own youngest son of, of, of when he was struggling, he was about three years old. And, and sometimes our kids struggle and sometimes our special kids struggle a little bit more than the average kid. So sometimes when you see a kid having a hard time, show them some grace, show them some, some compassion, Show them some love. Keep them safe. Don't let them hurt somebody else or hurt themselves. But I think I was probably preaching that day, and my wife was already tied up into some things. And, and Sister Mary went back, and she works fantastic with kids and starts to, to uh, de-escalate Isaiah and has a conversation with him. He's, what, three or four years old, wasn't he, Sister Mary? And then uh, Sister Mary's chatting with him. And, and at three or four years old, he was able to explain the entire plan of salvation and I call that saving faith. Yeah. To, to be able to know Jesus loves me, Jesus died for my sins, and Jesus lives. Amen. At three, four years old. I mean, that saving grace. And it's awesome that he found it at three, four years old. And I pray that as he continues to mature, that he never lets it go, just as I pray for all of you, that we never let go of the treasure that we found. Because um, it, it boggles my mind when I see folks, especially those of my own generation, uh, pro proclaiming publicly uh, that they've rejected the faith. That they no longer... They have questions, and they demand, they've had questions, and they demand that God gives them answers. 
And I, and I, I understand Nobody gets through this world unscathed. I understand people have hurts, people have wounds. I understand that those who uh, represent Jesus don't always represent him in the way that Jesus needs to be represented. I understand all those things, but in spite of all those things, that is no reason to cast off our faith or turn from the Lord. In fact, they ought to be things that cause us to run closer to him rather than run from him. And, and I believe this, that those, those who uh, reject Christ, even, even after they've known him, they're twice dead, plucked up from the grave. They've rejected salvation. We have to value what we have. The treasure, first, first way of seeing this is that the treasure is Jesus. The second way, second way of seeing this parable is this, that the treasure is you. That God sent his son. They called him Jesus. He came to love, to heal, and forgive. That of all the, of all the world religions, uh, all of them except Christianity, for all the other ones, it's man's attempt to rise up to God. For the, for the, for the Buddhists, they're trying to achieve nirvana and empty of themselves. For the Muslim, uh, they're trying to uh, live their, uh, according to their circumspect life, so if maybe they qualify enough, uh, their demon god, Allah, will let them in. Um, for, the, for the Hindu, they have like a million different gods. Like they don't even know which one they're really serving, but they're all demons. Um, to the atheists, they, they worship at the altar of logic and science. And if anybody's found anything out over these last three or four years, science is not something you want to put your trust in. <laughs> um, so so all, these other, all these other world religions, it's, it's man's attempt to rise up to God. And, and any of them, any of the other ones, they don't know... Look, they're not making it. They're not making it. But even for them, even in their own minds, they don't know if they're going to make it until the very end. They're living their whole life not knowing we're, this, is, this, is how our, this is how our good our God is. He doesn't, he doesn't call men to rise up to him, but he sends his son down to us. Um, we're assured of our salvation when we, when we yield to the Lord. We're not going to find out like right before our last breath whether we make it or not. But I know this, that I'm working out my salvation with fear and trembling. And I'm trying to honor God to his word the very best that I can. Um, that I know that I'm a sinner saved by grace through faith in him alone. That whoever calls upon the name of Jesus shall be saved, that as for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. The treasure, the treasure is you, that, that Jesus, 100% God, 100% man, even as Jesus was in heaven, descended to the, or came down to this earth so that he could live a humble life, born to poor rural parents, to Mary and his uh, adopted father Joseph, stepfather Joseph, uh, tempted in all ways, just like we are, it lived a perfect life. Um, he came down to us so that we could go up to him. He divested of himself uh, certain, uh, how do I want to say that, pastor? Uh, he divested of himself certain... Um, Exactly. Jesus divested of himself of some of his Godhead powers uh, and lived the life of an Old Testament prophet. And Jesus came first. One of the first sermons that Jesus, uh, or the, the sermon that's being preached as Jesus is on the scene, is this, is John the Baptist, his cousin, preaching, repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Make straight his paths. And I believe this. It is also our generation's clarion call to be those of a generation of Elijah who comes with that testimony that our, our proclamation is this, prepare ye the way of the Lord, make straight his paths. Jesus is coming again soon. I must decrease so that he can increase. 
Jesus came to us, sold, sold out to purchase us, ransom our lives. And the last one, part of this is this, is also this. When you find a treasure, what are you willing to pay for? What are you willing to give up? If you find something great, what are you willing to sacrifice in order to hang on to it? Because Jesus tells us this, totally worth it. John 14 and 6, Jesus says this. Jesus said to him, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. Here's the thing, folks. We're more valuable than we know. Turn over to 1 Peter chapter 1. And we're going to start in verse, actually, we'll start in verse 13. I like verse 13. <clears throat> First Peter chapter 1 and verse 13. Peter writing this is, Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober, and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Um, Another way of saying this is Peter telling folks, hey, it's time to tighten up the belt. It, it's, time, it's time to get things together. It's time to secure those things that are loose. Gird up the loins of your mind. And I know uh, it's been brought up here before that the imagery that, that Peter's giving here would be, uh, would be someone who's wearing probably a, a larger type of a robe or, or tunic type thing. And they would, as they were getting ready for action, they'd have to pull up the the hems of it and, and tighten it up so that they could move. Can you say amen? And we have to be ready to move and gird up the loins of our mind. It's, it's get the things that are up here that are loose, flying around, get them tightened up. And he goes on to say, be sober and rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ as obedient children, fully trusting can you say amen? Totally in faith. Um, completely dependent. Um, one of my big challenges that I'm trying that I've had that I've had to overcome through life is being too independent. Uh, I've grown up to how I've grown up, I was the responsible kid growing up in my house. I was the oldest. When there's a problem in the house, it's it's my fault. Isn't that right, Pastor? Problem in the family, my fault. Um, if one of my family members is going through something and there are two, or two people removed, it's still my fault because I should have been praying or I should have known or I should, something I didn't do. That's my own lie I tell myself, but you still feel responsible in that way. Um, even as a young kid, I was, I was the responsible one. Um, I was an obedient child. Um, but in, in that, I, I developed a, a pretty strong independence. And I figured out how to, I figured out how to make life whether I have a lot of people around me or hardly any people around me. Like sometimes I'm told, sometimes I'm really cool with not being around people sometimes, uh, but God hasn't called me to isolate from people, but he's called me to reach people. It, we, can't ha we can't retain that independent mindset and completely uh, surrender everything to the Lord. We have to trust in his grace, uh, put our hope into him. As obedient children, not conforming yourself to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. We were just talking about this a few weeks ago, that our lifestyle, the way we live, uh, we ought to live so that it brings glory to God. Why? Because it is written, be holy for I am holy, and God would not call us to be something or to do something and not empower us to do so. If he's called us to be holy, that means he's empowered us to be holy. Then in verse 17, Peter goes on, he says, And if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges, judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear. Now, does he mean we need to be afraid of every jumping spider that's coming our way? No, but I remember when uh, Brother Woody came here at the beginning of the year, which is the first time I'd heard him preach a message along that line, was bringing back the fear of the Lord. 
that awe, that respect, um, to know that he is all-powerful, that he is all-knowing, and at the same time, he's all-loving and he's all-good, um, that I can't just take my uh, walk with the Lord uh, flippantly, but I need to take it seriously, um, that we're serving as kingdom agents. Um, and if, back to verse 17, if you call upon the Father without partiality, judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your stay here in fear, knowing this, that you are not redeemed with corruptible things like silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by the tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot. This is the great exchange. This is the value of your life. This is the value of my life. Our lives to the Lord are worth the blood of Jesus. That's what it's worth. We're worth the blood of Jesus, the incorruptible blood that never loses its power. The great exchange. He exchanged his life so that I could live for him. Let's look at Ephesians chapter 2 and verse 10, if that doesn't convince you. Ephesians 2 and 10. <clears throat> Ephesians 2, 10 says this, For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus for good works, which God prepared before him that we should walk in them. This word workmanship, we brought it up many times. It means poema. It, it, it truly means God's masterpiece. That, that we are his workmanship. We are, he's the potter, we're the clay. He's molding us, he's making us. Have thine own way, Lord, have thine own way. You are the potter, I'm the clay. Uh, mold me and make me. Can you say amen? Uh, to, to, after your will. Jesus prayed this in the garden. Father, if there's any other way for this cup to pass from me, let it pass. But nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. Yielded to him. Um, that's, what, that's what it means to be his workmanship, that he's the one molding me. He's the one making me. I don't get to stand, I don't get to stand as the outside critic and begin to cast dispersion on what God's trying to do and accomplish in my life. Or raise my fist up to him and say, why have you made me like this? But here's the thing is, however he's fashioning us and how he's making us, we're still not finished products yet. And we know that according to Philippians chapter 1 and verse 6, that he who began a good work in us will complete it until the day of Christ. So when, when, do I, when does God stop working on me? When I see him face to face. Because when I see him, then I'll be like him. But as long as I'm here, as long as I'm breathing, he's going to be working on my life. He's going he's to work on my attitude. My attitude is not always perfect. I don't know if some of you are, some of yours are, but mine's not. Um, sometimes I get a little angry. Sometimes I get frustrated. Sometimes I get irritated. Sometimes I give instantaneous feedback that's not always constructive. Um, so my attitude... Um, my motivations, the Lord's still working on my motivations. Are you, are you doing this for the kingdom or are you doing it for yourself? Are you, are you lifting up this sacrifice so people can see Jesus? Or are you lifting up this sacrifice because it makes you feel good because other people acknowledge the sacrifice? Um, motivations, um, our attitudes, our, our actions. He's going to continue to work on our actions. Uh, I told my wife this uh, right uh, um, this uh, last this last January we celebrated our 21st wedding anniversary, and uh, and one thing I just I, young men with a, with age does come wisdom, so um, you'll know a little bit more in a couple decades. Um, <laughs> you'll you'll know a lot more in in a couple decades that you wish you knew right now. But if you listen to wise men like Pastor Jim and Pastor Al and Brother Jim and Brother Lee and these other ladies here who are wise women, you'll be, you'll be much further along. Can everybody else say amen? Yeah. <laughs> um, I, I, I told her this right at, shortly after our, our, 
our anniversary um, was this. Like I, I, I apologized to her right after our right after our anniversary, or about the time we're celebrating our 21st. Um, at our celebrating of our anniversary during the time in January, we kind of just like look at each other and go, hey, happy anniversary, here's a card, here's some flowers, we're good. Because it comes at the tail end of Hallelujah Party, Thanksgiving, Christmas program, Christmas Eve, Christmas, New Year's, and then our anniversary. By the time we get to our anniversary, we're worn out. So we give cards and kisses, which is still good. Um, but it, even having conversations with her afterwards, it was, I, I apologized to her. And she was like, well, well why? It's like, because, because I wish I knew how to love you back then the way I know how to love you today. Like, like I, I missed it for a lot of years. And, and not like missed it in a bad way. It's not like I was way off target. But you know, don't you? Don't you? You, 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 you come to a place of maturity and you come to a little bit of revelation and you go, you know what? You deserve better from me back then, and I'm sorry I wasn't able to give it to you. But also what that does is it puts the motivation in to do that much better and forward for the next 20 years. And, and I tell you this, it's, and, and those that have been married for a long time, um, it gets better, doesn't it? it? It's different, but it gets better. What's that do? Yeah. What's that, Pastor? Yeah, no, it's, it, it gets better because you learn how to love that person the way they need to be loved and the way they deserve to be loved. And, and it gets different and it's not, it, hey, the passion and the ooey gooey and all the butterflies and all the fireworks, that's all cool. That's still good. Can you say amen? That's nice because there's still times where I see my wife and my heart skips a beat similar to when I very first started seeing her. And that, that ought to still happen. But as you mature in that relationship, it, it changes. The dynamics of it change and it gets, it gets that much better. And, and the two really do become one. And if my wife and I are away from each other, it truly is as if somebody is like a piece of you is missing and uh, we need to be together for that. Um, that's the blessing of walking with the Lord. And, and he's still working on our lives. And he's, our, he's, he's fashioning us. He's making us. That we're not the finished product yet. We can still grow in his grace. We can still grow in his knowledge. Uh, let's look at uh, Second Peter, or Second Corinthians chapter 4. Second Corinthians four and verse seven. I'm continuing to talk about treasure. But we have this treasure in earthen vessels, that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed but not in despair, persecuted but not forsaken, struck down but not destroyed always caring about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our bodies. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our mortal flesh. So then death is working in us, but life in you. We have this treasure in earthen vessels. Why? So that the power may be of God and not of us. So visiting with Pastor Jim earlier this week, it, it's a dangerous spot when, when people in ministry start to attempt to manufacture the anointing. There's nothing that can replace the true anointing. Amen. I mean, we need the anointing in our lives. We need the anointing in our services. And I believe we have it here. Can you say amen? There's something, there is something special about this place. And you're like, you're just saying it because you've been here forever. And I'd say it no matter what. There's something special about this place. Uh, even, even when I'd been away, if I miss a couple services, I love walking through those doors because it's like coming back home. 
Um, it's like, oh, this is the place I'm supposed to be. Um, and it's because of the anointing in this place. And, and it's not because of the chairs and the carpet and the walls, but it's because of the people that inhabit this place. And it's about the Holy Spirit that inhabits the people who call this place home. And we need the anointing in our place because the, yoke, the anointing destroys the yoke of bondage. Can you say amen? It sets people free. It delivers people. It, it redeems uh, it points them to Jesus. It's the healing. We need inspired prophetic teaching and preaching that's anointed of God. We need people who have anointed ears that are ready to hear, hearts that are anointed, musicians that are anointed. We need the anointing in this place. And one thing that Pastor Jim and I made a vow to do here is like, we're not going to manufacture the anointing. We're not here to put on a show. We're, we're not here to give everybody else their cup of tea or to serve up just the thing that um, is on your menu, but we're here to prepare the Lord his cup of tea and serve what's on his menu. Because sometimes, sometimes what's on his menu is a convicting, powerful sermon that draws people to the Lord. Other times what's going to be on his menu is, is compassionate love and empathy that's drawing us in, that's healing hearts. And we're here, to, we're here to be facilitators of that anointing so he can increase. And in order for him to increase, we have to decrease. And we cannot do, let us in our generation, in our time, in our hour, not get caught up into uh, people or, or places or things that are manufacturing, manufacturing the anointing. Not every emotional response is the anointing. Can you say amen? Um, and just because it moves you to tears or moves someone to tears doesn't necessarily mean it's an anointing. Now, will the anointing move you to tears sometimes? Yes. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely. Um, the anointing brings peace in a place. Um, I'll, um, out of the number of, uh, one of the most stressful things that a, that a, a pastor or minister um, is a part of is is officiating the funeral service of someone who's passed on. It's intense. And, and there's various ones at various intensity levels, and some are, are joys and celebration, but your hearts are hurting. Other times there's challenges because of circumstances and family dynamics. But I know this, the times where I'm officiating a sermon and if Pastor Lori is playing the piano, the second she hits that first chord, it's like, <sighs> and I'm not speaking the truth, Pastor. It's like, whoo, and, and it's because of the anointing on, on her life as a psalmist and as a minister. It also brings familiarity. There's all these things, and, and we have this treasure in earthen vessels that we don't have to go out um, seeking signs and wonders. But I know this, because I'm a believer, signs and wonders follow me. And those who get caught up in manufacturing their own signs and wonders, they may get away with it for a little while, but they're not going to get away with it for long. Because this is what happens. Truly, it's this. Um, it does, once someone crosses that line into manufacturing the anointing, it gets easier and easier to where it's like, we'll just put the work in here and we'll just, prog we'll just program the Holy Spirit so we can draw an emotional response from people rather than, this is how I know, um, prayer, meditation, sacrifice, seeking the Lord, humbling ourselves, moving forward, going on afraid. That, that that's, what, that's what supercharges the anointing, and it, and it could get easy just to manufacture it, to create a little light show or a smoke machine. But I don't want the counterfeit anointing. I want the real. I want the true. I mean, prophetic words, what is thus saith the Lord? Um, words of wisdom, words of knowledge, gifts of miracles. Can you say amen? Gifts of faith operating in the life of, of those that call Jesus Lord. The, all nine gifts of the Holy Spirit uh, operating in conjunction for the betterment of the body. Tongues and tongues with interpretation. Not something that we're, now we have to position ourselves. We, we have to take a step of faith, but we cannot make God move on our behalf. Because if we make him move on our behalf, no longer is he Lord, but we're the one commanding him. 
and I'm supposed to be yielded to him. We have this treasure in earth and vessels that the excellence of the power of God may be, may be of God and not of us. We are hard pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We are perplexed, but not in despair. We're going to feel the pressure, but we're not going to get crushed because Jesus is the one protecting us. We're per per perplexed. There's things that I see that are happening in the world that just confound my mind. The craziness that is happening. I didn't even know. I was up in Chicago here a couple weeks ago, and Pastor Jim and I were just talking tonight. He's like, hey, did you hear what happened in Chicago right after you left? I didn't know. But it confuses me. It confounds me that this world is in the place that it's in. It, it, it confounds me why, why these people in the Middle East want to uh, drop a spark on that tinder so that uh, thousands or hundreds of thousands of people, especially innocent women and children, would die because of a conflict. It, 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 it confounds me that a terrorist group would instigate a war that would cause their own children to suffer and then cry foul because there's a reaction. You don't go, you don't go picking fights you can't win. And, and, and you don't go picking a fight where you may come out on the right side, or on one side, but your, your wives and your children come out on the short end. It, it perplexes me perplexes me the state of our world, perplexes me the state of some people, but I'm not in despair because my hope is in Jesus. And I know no matter what, I have this promise that Jesus is coming again soon. I have the hope for tomorrow. I have something to look forward to. We're persecuted, but not forsaken. Um, it's odd. It's odd that those uh, that are full of grace and truth as followers of Jesus Christ, that they're the ones that want to get canceled and silenced first. Persecuted, but not forsaken. That means he will never leave us, nor for, will he forsake it. Struck down, but not destroyed. And all these things, always caring about in the body, the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus may also be manifested in our bodies. Can you say amen? The the treasure is what you're willing to sacrifice or what you're willing to pay for it. The value is determined by the sacrifice. What are you willing to pay? Um, and we sacrifice to obtain and to maintain. It takes it, just because we get to a place doesn't mean we always stay there. And there comes a sacrifice in maintaining our walk with the Lord. And we cannot, we cannot be those who go to bed on our faith, but we have to be those that are always moving forward. What are you willing to give up today for a better tomorrow? We know this in Hebrews chapter 11 and 4, it says this, By faith Abel offered to God a more excellent sacrifice than Cain, though through which he obtained a witness that he was righteous, God testifying of his gifts, and through it, he being dead still speaks. Abel's sacrifice was a sacrifice of faith, whereas Cain's sacrifice was a sacrifice of obligation in Genesis chapter 4. Husbands and wives, they sacrifice themselves to be one. Sacrifice their individuality so they could be seen as one. Fathers and mothers, they sacrifice themselves to be parents. And all the parents said... Amen. We sacrifice of ourselves to be parents. And ladies, you sacrifice at a, at, a, at a tremendously deep level of even putting your life on the line, of, of just even bearing children and then raising them. We make sacrifices um, as, of ourselves as parents for our children. We sacrifice, we may sacrifice opportunity, we may sacrifice... Um, certain choices, and they're all worth it. Followers of, of Christ sacrifice themselves to be ministers or servants. We have to give of our time, our energy, our emotions. We have to be able to uh, draw from a wellspring of life when we're the one that's even going through the deepest, darkest valley in our own lives. 
We sacrifice of ourselves to be ministers or servants. We sacrifice our time, energy, and our competence for a job. We sacrifice our attention to understand. And we also sacrifice our wealth for generosity. I'd rather be known as someone who's generous than somebody who's wealthy. And folks, we have a, one of the things we've been blessed with for years is having a tremendously generous congregation here at Victorious Life Church. Each and every time uh, there's an offering that's taken up. Um, the offering that we took up for Sister Joy, I got a card from her this last tonight or th this afternoon. I forgot to bring it tonight, uh, but she she wants to send her thank yous to our church for the offering that we took up for her here a couple weeks ago, and uh, she she appreciated the prayers as she is coming out of the hospital. And in the card that she shared with me that I'll I'll put up so that everybody else can see it, she was sharing that even through the illness that she was going through at 92 years old, that what the enemy meant for harm, God is turning around for good and is bringing about a restoration between her and, one, and her daughter, Carla. And it's something that had been weighing on her heart for years. I mean... The, this is a sacrifice. This is a sacrifice sometimes as ministers, um, especially seasoned ministers. Th through their ministry, they're seeing other people come to know the Lord, and people come to the altars and get healed. And at the same time, simultaneously, they're seeing their kids suffer in the middle of it all. Yes. And sometimes you're wondering, like God, why are you? Why are all these people receiving, but this one who I love so much? is rejecting and and all i can say is i don't know all the answers but what i will say is i'll rejoice in the lord always and be glad that be glad that god is the god of the turnaround and believe that the work that's being done in that relationship uh, will continue to flourish and sh they'll have restoration um, in this last season of sister joy's uh, ministry i mean how awesome is that and also at the same time it gives hope for other people out there <sighs> we have a generous church and uh, can't thank everybody enough for their generosity, not only uh, during times where we take up special offerings, but just week in and week out. We have never lacked for anything here at Victorious Life Church. We haven't had, we haven't had brand new, spanking new everything all the time, um, but we've never been without. And we've always, had, we've always had enough to do what God's called us to do. And... and that's the, true, that's the true definition of prosperity. A prosperity is not five cars, six mansions, a couple vacation houses, spending time in Malibu, Cancun, or the Keys. The true prosperity is having enough to do what God's called you to do. We sacrifice our wisdom so that other people can learn. And we even do this. We sacrifice our activity so that we can be healthier. Keep in mind, there's always a price to pay. There's counter sacrifices as well. Some people sacrifice relationships due to their pride. Others sacrifice opportunities because of fear. Others sacrifice friendship because of ego. Others sacrifice humility by always having to be right. Sometimes people sacrifice communication by simply not listening. There's a reason why God gave us two ears and one mouth. <laughs> I think it's proportional. We should, we should listen twice as much as we talk. <sighs> and for us guys that get older and we start to tune our wives out, uh, we have no excuse because God gave us two ears. But it's her fault for not talking into my good ear. Uh, <laughs> I'm kidding. She's not in here to defend herself. What, am I, what did I say? Hallelujah. A few more things and we'll start to wrap up here. Are you getting anything out of this tonight? Matthew 25, we'll wrap up with this parable. Matthew 25 and 14. long parable we'll recap 
not, we won't break down every verse, but it's a good one. For the kingdom of heaven is like a man traveling to a far country who called his own servants and delivered his goods to them. And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to each according to his own ability. And immediately he went on a journey. Then he who had received the five talents went and traded with them and made another five talents. Doubled his money. That's pretty good. And likewise, he who had received two gained two more. Doubled his money. That's pretty good too. But he who had received one went and dug in the ground and hid the Lord's money. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants came and settled accounts with them. So he who had received the five talents came and brought five other talents, saying, Lord, you delivered to me five talents. Look, I've gained five more talents beside them. His Lord said to them, Well done, good and faithful servant. You were faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Verse 22, he also had received two talents, came and said, Lord, you delivered to me two talents. Look, I have gained two more talents beside them. And, he said, and his Lord said to them, well done, good and faithful servant. You have been faithful over a few things. I will make you ruler over many things. Enter into the joy of the Lord. Verse 24, then he who came had received the one talent, came and said, Lord, I knew you to be a hard man. Repaying, reap, reaping where you have not sown and gathering where you have not scattered seed. And I was afraid, and when you had hid your talent in the, and, and I was afraid and went and hid your talent in the ground, look there, you have what is yours. But his Lord answered and said to him, you wicked and lazy servant, you knew that I reap where I have not sown and gather where I have not scattered see, seed, so you ought to have deposited my money with the bankers and at my coming, I would have received back my own with interest. Therefore, take the, five, take the talent from him and give, to, give it to him who has ten talents. For to everyone who has more, more will be given, and he will have abundance. But from him who does not have, even what he has will be taken away. And cast the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Heavy, heavy parable. Few things to draw to draw out of this. God's economy is totally different from, from our government's economy. Can you say amen? Our government's economy is this. Take from those who have to give to those who don't. I don't mind paying taxes. I just don't want to pay anymore. Uh, I mean, I like roads and hospitals and schools and all that stuff. I just don't want to pay anymore. Or, the, what, or what I do pay, I want to get good value out of. Um, if I'm paying for... Uh, for my streets, then I don't want to see a bunch of potholes. <sighs> Anyways. Um, but the idea of, of our government is this, take from those who, who, who have to give to those who don't. This is God's economy. This is the word of God. You wrestle with it. it God's economy is this, you take from those who don't use and give to those who do. God's economy is this, take from those who don't use and give to those who do. One of my favorite quotes from a comic book, Uncle Ben said this, with great power comes great responsibility. To whom much is given, much is required, making the sacrifice for the treasure. Um, we steward our time. We steward our talents. And I know, don't get confused when I say talents in this context. The talents here was a financial talent, but the talent we have are our gifts, are our abilities. Um, we steward our resources. We steward our money. We steward our relationships. We, we manage them by the kingdom and for the kingdom. That's what this parable is about, is those who have been entrusted with something stewarding it properly so that the master receives his reward. And we've had things invested in us. Also out of this, I, I like to draw out of this, don't despise the day of small beginnings. We all start somewhere. Every trip begins at the beginning. Every endeavor, every project, there's a beginning. Every program there's a beginning. Don't despise the day of small 
beginnings. I think of this often. I listened to a sermon series that Pastor Jim had given me probably 15, 20 years ago um, on, uh, on the ministry of the set man. And I listen to it about once a year, every year. Um, and one of the things that's drawn out from that one is this, that um, at the beginning, even if we think of our regular schooling, everybody starts out going through the same ABCs, one, two, threes, kindergarten, first, second, third, fourth grade, on up through our, our grade school age. Everybody's going through the same thing, same curriculum, pretty much the same everything. Um, you get a little bit, a little bit, a little bit of diversity by the time you get to middle school and then on to high school. But for most of your time in education, everybody's pretty much receiving the same thing. They're all starting out at the same point. And truthfully, if you look at it on an education cycle, and nobody really starts to specialize into their degree until the last two years of college. Is that right? It's about right. For, for the most part, we're all starting at the beginning. We're all going through the same steps. We're all going through similar seasons as we progress with the Lord. And what makes the difference between someone who's going far and someone who isn't moving along. It's not that they aren't getting the same, it's not that they aren't put, being put through the same paces as that one keeps on going and the other one tends to stop. They get frustrated in the day of small beginnings. They, get, they, they sow a seed and they're out there checking it the very next day looking for the sprout in the ground. They haven't uh, taken in the principle of seed time and harvest that there's a time to sow, there's a plan, time for planting, there's a time for watering, there's a time for reaping, um, that you may not see the rewards of your labor until far in the future, but it's always, always worth it. Don't despise the day of small beginnings. Don't despise the day of small beginnings in your prayer life because everybody starts out praying. Everybody starts out praying clunky, and not tripping over words, but those that, the, those that are able to tap in are those that don't quit. Um, don't despise the day of small beginnings in your understanding of the word of God because it'll grow, you'll grow in grace and truth. Um, don't despise the day of small beginnings in ministry because most of the time anybody that's been preaching or teaching, most of them has started out mowing grass, sweeping floors, wiping down tables, cleaning toilets and they had to start somewhere and then they took advantage of opportunity after opportunity uh, the faithful servants here two of the three are commended because they took what their lord had given them um, has stewarded it properly and returned to their master an investment the one wicked servant who was cast out um, buried it didn't put it to use i know this those here those of us we do have that treasure and earthen vessel. Let's steward it. Let's bring, let's bring something to the master's hand. Can you say amen? For the kingdom, by the kingdom. And we'll receive our reward. And at the end of the day, I've said this before multiple times, um, there's one thing that I'm seeking. Uh, I, don't need, I don't need accolades of men or I don't always need a pat on the back, but it's nice to get a pat on the back or somebody to say thank you. Um, I don't, I don't need to have the biggest house on the block or, or the most number of cars or, or I don't have to climb up to become the top of a, a company. But one thing I want to work for always is that at the end of my time, when I see the Lord face to face and I'm judged according to my works and I'm judged, or I'm judged according to the works of Jesus in my life, um, but at the same time, I receive my reward the one thing I want to receive from the Lord is this. Well done, good and faithful servant. Come and enter into my rest. Like, I may not think it was that much, but if God thinks it's that much, it means that much. And it doesn't mean we're going to have to win a million people to the Lord or operate a multi-million dollar ministry in order to get that commendation. The way we get that commendation is, I believe this, living for him every day, fully dependent, trusting in him, even as Peter said, as obedient children, living our life soberly, 
vigilantly knowing that we're kingdom-minded and he's doing the work that's being finished in us. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. Pastor Jim, we want to close us in prayer, please. Thank you, Father, for your word. Thank you for the ability we have to come together, Lord. We're looking for great things to happen in the future in the kingdom, Lord, as you begin to move across this nation and touch hearts and change lives, Lord. We just pray and, and thank you that uh, you'll, you'll cause us to be a part of it, Lord. Uh, not just be uh, someone chasing the fire, but those that will start a fire and spark other people to set fire to. We pray this in Jesus' name. Bless everybody as they leave this place tonight. We look after them. Take care of them. Let the angels of the Lord encamp around about them. Keep them free from sickness and disease. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, amen. amen. God bless you all. We love you. We'll see you here Sunday morning at 10 o'clock. And Pastor Jim's preaching Sunday morning, so you don't want to miss. <laughs> Maybe.